I will project. The website will just see. Okay. okay. Uh, so today, uh, for our speaker, we have Slav Petrov. Uh, Slav uh, uh, did a lot of really great work at Berkeley um, with Dan Klein, a lot of work in coaching and instruction learning. Um, uh, wrote a lot of papers that a lot of us have read and continue to give to each of the incoming graduate students. And now, uh, for the last couple of years, he's been uh, with uh, Google um, doing a lot of the same, a lot of really great work uh, that a lot of us have been reading. Quite intently, so I look forward to the talk. Thanks, man, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, go in the back. Please remind me to speak up if I get quiet. So um, I gave this talk a fairly long title: uh, "Fast, Accurate, and Robust Multilingual Syntactic Analysis," and I'll try to cover all the, the aspects of it. We'll talk about fast and accurate pricing first then robustness in terms of domain and task adaptation, and then um, how we can build parsers for other languages. And this is work that I've done in Google uh, with Ryan McDonald. Uh, he's like one of my primary collaborators, but then Hunter and us and Sasha Rash as interns, as well as uh, Keith Hall, Michael Ringer, Terry Quinn, and we'll call ourselves the uh, parsing team at Google. So, uh, the first is a general uh, intro of why parsing. Well, Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. And right now, we just do keyword-based search. And it's, it's a very useful service, as all of, I, I don't need to tell you, but I think we should be more ambitious. And we should try to do things like question answering. And questions can come in uh, various types. So, there's simple facts you can query, like what's the capital of Wyoming? Um, but the questions can also be harder and be like, uh, of the type of which painters don't upset the stomach. So here, we're unlikely to just find a web page that has an answer. We might have to collect information from different sources and aggregate it and do some inference. And then there are also open-ended questions, like what are the main issues in the global warming debate, where there's no clear-cut answer. And so, um, it will take a while um, till we get to the last ones, but hopefully we can start tackling the easy ones that are facts easy. And already in 2005, um, I took the screenshot uh, with this question, what is the capital of Wyoming? And um, Google was, was starting to, to get into the space and giving a definition. Um, now, we're much more confident, and we actually have the best guess for uh, Wyoming capital is uh, Japan and give you some sources. So um, this, is, this is promising, but it's all based on uh, simple heuristics and bag of words models. And this is exemplified in the second example. Um, what is the population of France? Well, actually, um, if you type what is the population of France, we'll drop all the function words and stop words, and then you strip the query down to population of France, and we'll give you actually the right answer. Uh, there's this nice chart showing how the population of France has evolved. But then if you asked what was the population of France in 2002, well now our simple heuristics don't work anymore. And actually the set of results gets much, much worse, even though the information was in that uh, first uh, set of results and in the table that was used to generate the plot. And that's because we don't actually really process the structure of the queries and analyze the question, but just look for keyword over. And I would like us to, to move beyond that and look at the structure of sentences. Uh, in a very different domain, uh, machine translation, um, we can also get quite far with uh, word-based models, but we'll need to look at stru structure and syntax if we want to get uh, grammatical translations. So for French, um, things work quite well. Um, I took the slide, um, the screenshot in January when the SOPA and TIPA debate were, were going on, and I wanted to see what the French press is saying. Since I don't read French, I just went to Google Translate and translated it. This one page, <coughs> and it says, um, curb illegal downloading, three measures have been developed, PIPA, Protect Intellectual Property Act, the equivalent of the Senate SOPA, and SOPA, allow DNS blocking, blah, 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 blah. So it's not perfect, there are some discrepancies, but it works uh, quite well. And that's because English and French have fairly similar word order. There's some local reordering that can be captured by a phrase-based model. And um, 
things come out quite nicely. But if we look at a different language, Japanese, where the syntactic structure is quite different than, uh, than in English, things are a lot worse. So looking at the second sentence uh, here in the uh, English translation, Mr. Wales is a copyright protection bill pending in Congress caused a controversy for the SOPA has said it intended to suspend operations as a protest along with other websites. So um, there's some bits and pieces that make sense, but the overall sentence structure has been completely lost. And um, it's not grammatical, and the meaning is also lost. Without knowing what's going on, I should get uh, something that is complete garbage. And that is because just using um, surface level statistics and, no, and not taking the structure of the sentences into account is just not sufficient in this context. And so that's why I think we need to analyze the structure of sentences and language when, um, if we want to get closer to uh, language understanding. And my uh, um, take on this is that, well, I would like to get to semantics at some point, but it's too hard. Let's do syntax first. And syntax can, can help us um, get, get closer to semantics and to meaning. So this simple sentence, they solve the problem in statistics, is something that I often use to show how uh, different syntactic analyses can correspond to different meanings. And so uh, to make it very clear, there's the one reading, which is probably the, the more obvious one. Um, they solve the problem. So a problem is being solved, and statistics are being used to solve it. But there's this also slightly awkward, uh, potentially or funny, uh, other meaning, uh, reading of the sentence where there's a problem with statistics that is being solved and we don't know how. And um, part of speech tags oftentimes help us disambiguate the meaning of words or the grammatical function. In this particular case, knowing what the words, nouns, and prepositions are is actually not sufficient because we need to disambiguate how this prepositional phrase <coughs> with statistics attaches to the rest of the sentence. So um, one way of doing uh, the sentence analysis is to look at uh, the dependency parts of the sentence and say, well, this preposition, you know, phrase with statistics, if it attaches to the verb, then uh, statistics are being solved and uh, statistics are being used to solve the problem. And the alternative reading, um, would correspond to this syntactic part three, um, where the prepositional phrase attaches to the null phrase. So uh, the, the goal of this talk will be about predicting these parse trees accurately and efficiently and for many languages. So we would like to be able to do this not only just for English, but for all um, <coughs> the world's languages, including languages for which we don't have labeled data. And even for the ones that we do have labeled data, it's going to be a harder problem than just training a parser for that language because we would like to have a universal set of labels. We would like to be able to take a sentence and ask what's the main verb or what is the subject of that sentence. And typically the annotations that we have from linguists for, uh, they'll differ for each language and we need to unify them so that we can build applications that are not language specific but uh, can just uh, take these uh, sentence structures and uh, use them uh, to do question answering or machine translation or any type of language understanding. So um, the outline of the talk will be uh, trying to cover the different parts of the set uh, of the title. Um, first we'll talk about squeezing as much information out of the, the labeled resources that we have in building fast and accurate models. So um, even though we might not have resources for all languages, I would argue that we should use the ones that we have and bootstrap off of them because just starting from plain text and doing unsupervised parameter is too hard. So this um, work is uh, joined with Sasha Rush and is actually currently in submission. Um, so it's brand new. We'll then um, look a little bit at uh, domain adaptation. So training on a new wire corpus from the 80s uh, is not exactly um, representative for parsing the web or pars uh, parsing documents that are supposed to get translated <coughs> as a service on the translate.google.com. And um, we'll talk about how we can use um, read supervision 
uh, to adapt the parser for the task that, that is being used. And then um, the last part, um, I'll try to um, uh, get to it. And if we don't get there, um, then uh, I'll have to talk offline. It's going to be about uh, multilingual <coughs> tagline parser projection from one page to another. So is everybody with me so far? Um, and please feel free to stop me and ask questions. Um, this doesn't have to be just a lecture. All right. So the way I see dependency parsing, um, I would structure it roughly in two uh, types of approaches. There are a few others, but um, to simplify things, there are transition-based parsers um, that are typically greedy in nature, and they're fast because they process the sentence left to right, uh, maybe keeping a small beam. Um, but um, they're quite accurate and um, give us uh, the benefit of, of, of a high, sp of, of high speed. Um, and then there are graph-based parsers that are slower because they run an exhaustive inference algorithm um, and typically uh, use dynamic programming. They allow higher order factorizations, so um, they can be at the end more accurate. But unfortunately, they're significantly so. So without uh, taking the proportion back into account, just as a sketch, if we plot speed over accuracy, uh, a greedy um, deterministic shift reduced uh, uh, parser is linear in time, and uh, kind of the bottom left of this graph. Uh, if we introduce a beam and higher order features, um, depending on the size of the beam, k, um, even though it's still uh, linear, um, the k can play a big role since the sentences are typically of length 20, so if k is 60, it's actually at least cubic, <laughs> at least quadratic. Um, and um, then when we go to graph-based parsers, um, first order and second order parsers um, have uh, cubic time algorithms, but because of the feature cost, um, the second order are, of course, slower. And then third order parsers um, are probably the most accurate ones that we have these days, but they're n to the fourth and really much so. And so what we'd like to have is something that is as fast as the, uh, as accurate as the, the most accurate models, the third order models that we know how to build, but it's at the speed of a um, k-best uh, shift reduced parser. And so, doing this, getting an exact algorithm for this is unlikely to exist. Um, so we'll need to sacrifice exactness and settle for some, an approximate solution that exploits the, the problem structure. Um, the so, okay, so yeah. What do you mean by first order, second order? All the factorizations, like whether you have just features over arcs or over, um, like over a pair of words, or whether you take the siblings and on this graph, by speed you mean you, or you mean time, right? Where the longer, the slower ones are, the slower ones are on the right. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, actually, it should be time. Yes. Okay. Uh, wrong answer. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, We, we already saw some dependency uh, parsers, but just to make things a little uh, more explicit and to introduce this uh, matrix location that I'll use. Um, when we um, are trying to um, find the, the most likely parser, we're going to be examining pairs of words and computing scores for an article that goes from, um, from the hand to the modifier. And this can be... Um, in the form of a matrix where uh, the arc from when to as corresponds to this entry in the matrix and we can compute a score for it. And so on and so forth. So uh, in general, if we were to compute scores for all possible arcs, they are n squared arcs. And so this matrix has n squared cells. Um, as a result, kind of if we, if we fill that matrix without doing any inference about finding the best uh, parser, just computing the scores for these arcs would be already uh, n squared. But we said we wanted to be 
linear um, time. So we cannot afford uh, to fill that matrix. First order parse is basically fill that matrix and then try to find the best combination. And that's why they're uh, in cubed. So to get something that is linear, we'll need to find ways to um, fill in only the entries of this matrix that, that map. And so uh, to do this, we'll, we'll, we'll need to look at the problem structure and uh, try to find heuristics uh, or um, ways to, to skip all certain entries. So. Okay, so. Um, um, so, one thing we can do is um, just go through our uh, training data and look at um, the lengths of the arcs that occur. And so, here I'm plotting uh, arc lengths, uh, absolute length, and the fraction of. Um, of times for particular part of speech types. So for adjectives as uh, modifiers, we can see that um, the majority of arcs are of length one. So adjectives typically attached to the noun that is immediately following. Um, and that's more than 60%. Uh, then the of the remaining ones, uh, about 20% are um, attached to a word that's too uh, positions away, maybe there are two adjectives in sequence, and then less than 10% of the arcs um, are flanked three, and then things tail off quite quickly. So we actually, when we have an adjective, we don't really need to examine all the words in the sentence. We just need to look at a global context. Uh, and one more question: uh, If you did the same graph but you had signed length with positive for to the left, would the would any of these be particularly different? <coughs> Um, a little bit. I'll show you um, uh, a heat map okay. in the next slide. Okay. So, so you're going to set a limit to how far you're going to look? Uh, for we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Okay. But so that's the intuition. That, like, we don't really need to look for all words. Um, and like, we might make errors. Um, so we need to account for that. But um, we should focus our attention on the close ones. If we find something, we should take that. And if we don't find something, then we should make it. In that matrix you're showing us going to look off the diagonal in a few exactly like, okay and you can look and you you can look arbitrarily far away if things if need okay be. okay that's the talk um, so uh, I, I'm glad you're here for um, and thank you so for verbs the distribution is a little flatter um, again like things are a lot of the things are close by but um, the mod, uh, the heads can be further away and so uh, we cannot kind of just have a very high cutoff and say nothing uh, exists. At least that's why he knows what's coming. Um, so here's the heat map that I mentioned. Um, and it's maybe a sort of crazy thing to do, but uh, we just took the death set and plotted um, what fraction of um, arcs exists between a particular modifier and head position across sentences of different lengths and diff different grammatical structures, you can see this clear diagonal because things typically attach to them, to things that are very local. And it is a little bit more forward than backward, um, but it's, it's fairly symmetric. I, I mean, it's not super symmetric, but like, it's definitely um, one goes to two, two goes to three, and then it's a little bit. <coughs> so the intuition will be to ignore um, arcs that are longer than a fixed cutoff uh, in a first pruning step, and then um, examine only certain entries uh, when needed. So the nice thing about that, like, we'll cut the matrix and we'll just keep something that is um, of constant length with B, which makes now um, the matrix have rather than n squared elements, uh, or again times B elements. And thanks to, to Jason and uh, Noah Smith, uh, we know how to parse using those constraints. It's called white parsing, and it's an extension of the regular parsing algorithm um, where we can, for, for things that fall outside, um, 
this band, we can attach them to, to the root, or we we'll would use a special handling for those items so that they can be revisited in a later pass. Like we'll do this in a, rather than using this as our final parsing pass, we'll do a multi-pass procedure where we first disintegrate the, the local things and then go uh, to higher order models and examine what's left over and try to uh, attach things that are uh, more long distance. So to do this, we'll introduce um, what we call outer arcs. And basically, this says that um, a particular modifier didn't find a head um, in, in the local window, so it's looking for a head outside of that band. Uh, we cannot explicitly condition on every, uh, every word here because then it will be back to squared, but we can compute aggregate features that are just based on a modifier and maybe some statistics of the sentence. And so we can score how likely a modifier is to have a head outside of the bed. And similarly, we can score for a head how likely it is to receive uh, a modifier outside that bed. So for the things that fall inside the the band, uh, the band, we will just run our, uh, we'll compute the regular scores, but uh, for the things outside, we will just aggregate things. So we'll, once we have run um, the algorithm for this particular sentence, as required near it, times one while, we might not end up with um, something, a pruning mass that looks like this. Uh, everything that's white has been removed because it fell below our pruning threshold. Um, so for some words, uh, we have completely disambiguated what the head modifier relation is. For others, we have several possibilities within um, the band for a possible head. And for others, we have also other marks because we were not happy with, with the things that were local with it. And then we can move on to a first order model that now can look at each individual word within that outer arc and compute a score. Um, run global inference on the remaining things, figure out what the best structure is, and either extract the one best parse tree, or again, prune and move on to a second order model, where again, we've removed um, additional arcs that have a low score under the first order model, for example, this arc, and um, go to the second order model and keep on it. So, because in each step we remove <coughs> parts of the um, of the possible arcs, we can afford to apply a more complex model to the remaining arcs in the next step without having to pay the high price of running this model exhaustively from scratch. So without going kind of... So, um, earlier when Chris asked you what the first order and second order were, I didn't understand your answer and I didn't think it mattered, but now it looks like it matters. So could you explain that so again? It's, it's not really, so this figure doesn't really do justice, doesn't really show. Um, and I mean, I'm not sure I have enough time to kind of go into the details of describing um, the parsing algorithm. But basically, in first order parsing, you look only at the, at the pair of words, a head and a modifier, and you can have features, um, and you have features over the part of speech tags, the word and then is maybe about the feature, uh, the, the words in between them. And your dynamic program is trying to stitch together a sentence just looking at a parse tree from these arcs. In the second order parsing algorithm, your dynamic programming um, items are not individual arcs, but they are arcs with a sibling attached to them. And so you have more information and more uh, things that you can condition your features on. But your dynamic programming search space is also significantly larger. And so, um, therefore, um, uh, inference is more costly. Okay, that's great. Um, yeah. yeah. So, since you'll be looking outside of the band, so your worst case performance is still the same as in the exhaustive parser, right? Well, so unless we prune, like for example, here for a while, like we prune all these words as possible hats, um, because there was no other art that was predicted. So, we can make a search error if um, the gold hat was in there. But there's no guarantee that you'll prune. If you're, it's a very bad example that you know your partial is really confused, you may end up still looking at all any square possible. So. Oh, um, so oh, you you mean the opposite? Like we might not prune anything? Yeah. 
No, so we'll, um, we'll get there. I will just give you the kind of the, the highlight. Uh, we'll prune um, a certain amount. <coughs> we haven't looked at kind of what we can give as a topic guarantees that uh -huh. will, will reduce the complexity. But in practice, uh -huh. um, we definitely go down to linear. And because we prune at least half of the entries, um, like it is unlikely that we'll just be left over with uh, with all the cards. The comp is still the same as symptomic performance. That's what I'm saying. Like, um, it's it's hard to show something as a topic, mm -hmm. um, but average performance. But average performance is not bad. And the pruning is just based on max marginals. Yes. Um, so, kind of. Um, there we go. Um, so it's max marginals with structure prediction states the next three sides. So uh, rather than using the series, uh, we'll compute max marginals. So um, the the map parse um, support the most likely um, basically the Turbi derivation um, has predictor score, and a max marginal for uh, an arc is going to be the highest score of a parse tree that has that particular arc. And so, and, and we can do we can compute max marginals for the altar uh, in a similar way by saying what's the most likely parse tree with any arc uh, with an altar arc in this particular position, and we'll train to minimize the pruning loss. So David Weiss and Matt Tasker had this um, nice paper for sequence modeling, and we're extending it here to, to parsing. So rather than training for one best prediction, um, the models that will be used for pruning. Where we'll try to optimize them uh, to minimize the pruning. Error. So the way that we'll set the pruning threshold can be written down in math, um, where we have the math score and a convex combination of the math score and the average uh, math, uh, a max marginal. Um, I think it's much nicer to look at the, the plot. So basically, the max, uh, uh, the math score is going to be. At the, at the max, and we're forming a convex combination of the max and the mean, and we have a parameter alpha that allows us to trade off efficiency for the running the risk of making a prune, pruning error. If we set alpha to zero, we'll keep half of the max marginals, so we'll keep half of the, the chart. Um, if we set alpha to one, we'll keep only the one best derivation, and we'll, we'll probably um, I think in our experiments we ended up using something like alpha 0.6. So we will prune the majority of the entries. And um, our training objective is going to try to push the gold label above the, uh, the threshold. It's not going to try to make it the one best necessary, but it just wants it to survive. And um, here's the training objective. Um, it's the same one as in uh, Weiss and Tascar. Um, and I'm happy to talk about it offline, but in the interest of covering more topics, I decided to just give you the intuition. So uh, the goal is to filter as many arts as possible without removing the, the gold part. And the nice thing is that um, once you do all the math, you end up with an algorithm um, that is very similar to, um, the updates are very similar to the, the ones in the perceptron um, and the stochastic area. So, um, how well does it work? Well, we pruned the alpha pruning threshold um, so that we don't lose anything in accuracy. And um, I, I normalized everything relative to an unpruned first order model. Um, so the relative speed is one for that model. Um, and a simple heuristic that allows you to double the speed, and for some reason not many people seem to use, is if you have never seen an arc between a pair of our speech tags, just don't don't try to predict one there. It's similar to using a tagging dictionary when doing our speech technique. Um, and um, it introduces no search error because the model usually never predicts such errors anyways. And um, it gives you a two-fold speed up. And then um, Shay, who I wasn't I didn't know was here, um, did some some very nice work on using local predictors to prune chart cell items. And um, that gives you a 3.7-fold uh, speed up. Um, but if we do our line uh, cascade, where we do first the line parse, we resolve the local ambiguities, and then in the first order pass, 
need only to look at um, things that are left over and potentially fill in the outer art uh, uh we can get an almost five-fold improvement mm -hmm. for first order parsing. Uh, and comparing to a shift reduced parser with a, with a beam, um, to get a similar performance, we need a beam of size A <coughs> and a particular set of features. And in our implementation, uh, those models now perform roughly on par. Um, if we go to a second order model, the parsing accuracy jumps up by more than a percent. And um, the figure looks similar. So um, the same uh, baseline as before. I've added um, what I attribute to, to Terry Koo here, um, just doing a first order pruning pass. That's something that he did for his third order parser. And that uh, model is trained uh, using uh, just for one best prediction. So uh, it's not using the structure prediction cascade uh, objective. But um, we do here a fine pass followed by a first order pass. Um, and do, even though we're doing a total of three passes, we are faster than um, in the other models. And also now getting faster than the, uh, the shift reduce model. And the third order model, again, another percent touch point in, uh, accuracy improvement. And now the, uh, the real benefits of the, the cascades start showing um, compared to um, the exhaustive inference, so exhaustive third order parsing is 100 times slower than exhaustive first order. Um, we can get a 200 fold uh, speed up by doing a cascade of a fine parse, first order, second order, and then um, third order parsing. And we are also significantly faster than the uh, shift reduce parser with a large beam. So, any questions about this part? Yeah. Did you use our code or did you? Uh, we replement. We replement. So it's, I mean, basically with our features, but like trying to stay as close as possible. Yeah. So, so the uh, bind parser filter and the cascade is using only a first order model, or is that also using it's a higher order model? It's a first order. Would there be some benefit to uh, using higher order models at that stage? Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, there's fewer arcs that could be interacting at that point. Yeah. So um, my intuition is that. It wouldn't be, but I, I mean, it's a, one thing that I'm not too happy about this model right now is that I didn't talk at all about the features. And the features that you use for one best prediction might be different than the ones you want in your pruning. And similarly, um, when you add more features, your model gets more expensive. So we have a slightly reduced set from basically this, the features from McDonald, uh, Ryan's work, is what we use for pruning. And then Terry Koo has introduced a bunch of them additional features which we use for the final models. And so I think there's some space of kind of trying to figure out what features to use and maybe to do a second order of binding class might help. Um, there's some free parameters that we can do. Uh, and there's unfortunately no automatic way to do that. Yeah. Alright. Um, so um, these accuracies of 93% like unable support uh, look great. Uh, but that's on the Wall Street Journal, and we want to actually parse real text. So um, if we evaluate on some out of the main test sets, um, and I'm showing the greedy first order KBEST and the second order model, they don't have the third order models so offhand. Um, so when we go to, to the Brown Corpus, or uh, there's this British uh, National Corpus, a football forms data, or a question tree bank, the accuracies go down significantly. And, um, for whatever reason, um, the parsing community always complains that we all fit into the Wall Street Journal, but very few people evaluate actually on these other data sets. Part of the reason I think is that they're not, some of these are not so well known, they are not professionally annotated by the LBC, and so people might not trust them. Um, but I think it's important to, to look at, at real test sets, and so um, hopefully some of you have heard it. Um, we, um, we use Google, um, funded the LBC to create a web uh, corpus and we organize a shared task. So a plug here. Um, there will be a Google Web Tree Bank um, which contains five uh, web domains, blogs, news groups, reviews, emails, and question answering. Uh, it was annotated by the LBC, so the same people who did the Pen Tree Bank uh, according to the same guidelines. And for each domain, we picked, uh, 
uh, about 2,000 sentences were, uh, were annotated, and there is a large pool of unannotated sentences of at least 100,000 per domain from uh, the same sample that can be used for semi-supervised learning. And we're organizing a shared task, and if you want the data, you can get it now. And just to finish my talk, and it's going to be otherwise uh, released through the LDC in the summer, uh, so you should get it. Yeah, I forgot to make that point. Um, so the second order model is more accurate than the KBEST model on the Wall Street Journal, but um, on the out-of-domain data, uh, this difference can fit and kind of shows that graph-based models are pretty good at memorizing the Wall Street Journal, uh, but quite not generalized as well. In that particular it's set up with the particular features of learning that might change. Uh, I don't think it's a yeah, model problem, I think it's for this one. And so that's why just trying to get the highest number of the on the Wall Street Journal might not be actually the, the best thing to do if you want to reduce the best. Yeah. Are the football QTV uh, corporate part of the Google web? No. So where did you get the full stuff? Um, so the football purpose is um, something that Jennifer Foster did. She had an ACO 2010 paper. Um, I'm not sure she has released it on her web page, but if you know her, she'll get it to you. And the question tree bank is also somebody from Dublin, um, John Judge, created that. And actually, Chris Manning fixed it up, and he's re uh, redistributing uh, another version of this web page, or this type of web page. <coughs> and BNC is also something that Jennifer Foster did. Um, so Dublin. But um, yeah, so hopefully this will become uh, de facto standard test in the future. And, um, but um, when we kind of started using the parsers um, at Google, one of the first thing, places that we used them was the machine translation. And the idea goes to um, Michael Collins and has been <laughs> followed up by, by many people. Um, probably some of you here have used this idea that um, instead of going all the way to incorporating syntax into the decoding model, a simple way of getting some of the benefits of syntax from machine translation is to do so-called pre-ordering. So we'll parse the sentence and then we'll apply a set of handwritten or automatically learned rules to change the word order. For example, in Japanese, the verb tends to be at the, at the end. So we'll move it to the end. We'll create this uh, English sentence in a target um, <coughs> word order and we'll then translate it. And this tends to work uh, better than straight phrase-based translation um, and allows us to kind of, in a cheap way, incorporate uh, syntax. So um, we started looking at this, this task and um, kind of the machine translation team at the same time uh, was looking at different evaluation metrics and they found that this reordering score, uh, which basically measures how well can we change the word order, correlates uh, very well with uh, subjective evaluations on the final translation task. Basically saying that after you have reordered for Japanese English translation, um, the, the translation process introduces errors, but they can be factored out to a certain extent, and it's really important to just get the, the work on it right. So we are working with them, and um, we looked at um, the reordering score on a particular set of 5,000 hand annotated uh, sentences. And this is sort of the progress that we've made um, over the last year and a half, um, actually, the last summer, um, just from changing the parser, uh, keeping everything else constant. Uh, measuring on machine translation quality, this gave uh, an improvement of one to uh, one and a half blue points. Um, but in the subjective evals, the improvements were. Uh, even bigger. And um, I'm not going to be able to talk about all the steps um, because of lack of time, but I will just give you some of the highlights. Uh, we started off with by using a shift reduce parser, vanilla uh, shift reduce parser trained on the Wall Street Journal. Um, we moved over to a KBEST transition based parser, which has a high accuracy, and that gave a big improvement. Uh, we then did what we call up training. 
uh, using uh, my thesis parser to generate noisy training data that is in domain and it's not correct, but it's a little bit more accurate than that one from the transition parser and train on that. That helped. Um, we then did what we call targeted up training where we used the reordering data as implicit feedback and then they were a big bump. Um, switching just to a case insensitive model, um, <laughs> actually an important thing to do. Uh, we realized that quite, uh, quite late, uh, but it helped. And adding more uh, of the reordering data that was annotated by bilingual speakers, but it's much cheaper to generate than data uh, annotated with full parse trees. Um, again. And then um, what I want to talk about is this <coughs> augmented loss perception training idea for adapting the parser to the task at hand. So I um, assume everybody's familiar with the, with the basic perceptron. So in perceptron training, we take our current model parameters, um, predict the most likely output uh, for the current input, and uh, do an update to the parameter vector to make a mistake. So we just go through our data and it consumes our uh, training instances one at a time. Now when we do this, what we call augmented um, loss uh, training, um, we'll have an extrinsic data set um, that is labeled with different labels. So these are not full parse trees, but for example, in the machine translation case, these are sentences and their target word order. Uh, for the, the language that we're interested in. And um, the only thing that we require is that we can evaluate um, a loss for the model prediction. So basically we can take a predicted parse tree and feed it into a system that will tell us some score. Um, and this loss function doesn't need to be composed at all according to the model structure or um, even the output spaces don't need to be the same because in this case uh, we're looking at reordered sentences. We don't really care about the parser. Um, and so then we'll iterate between training on the intrinsics data and um, picking up examples from the extrinsic. Um, so to make it more explicit, uh, when we pick up an extrinsic data example, we'll produce uh, model predictions. And this can be just samples from the model, or in our particular case, uh, a k-best list of parse trees. We can then feed them into the reordering component and get the uh, reordered sentence, which we then can evaluate on, um, on the manually annotated data. And so we can see whether the one best model prediction gives us the best reordering score, or maybe if the third best parse tree um, actually produces a better reordering score. The parse trees that themselves don't really matter in this process because we only use them as an intermediate representation. And if the third best is better, has a better reordering score than the first one, well, then we'll do a perceptron update in that direction. Um, and so we'll bypass uh, computing gradients uh, by using the perceptron. And by using a k-best list, we can um, get away with not making any assumptions about the loss function. So okay. using 5,000 sentences that have been labeled with uh, their target word order, um, and the Wall Street Journal is a training set. Um, we can see that kind of mixing the standard training with like, this is the update scheme, how many examples of uh, intrinsic data we pick up for each uh, intrinsic uh, data point. Uh, we see that for exact match, we can improve from 35 to 39. Uh, and for the fuzzy reordering score, what fraction of words are in the correct order, uh, we also improve from 76 to 78. And as I showed on an earlier plot, even for that kind of the fancy system that had been trained on a bunch of other different data sets, we still get a, a measurable improvement. And humans, when given uh, an option, preferred the translations that came out of the system using um, the new uh, the new parser. Um, so I just had a question here. Other um, so I don't have the, the numbers in the, in the slides. Uh, depending on uh, the exact setting, it either stays flat or it drops a little bit. Like we don't drift away too far, but we also cannot measure it, at least on a Wall Street Journal. Like if we had parse trees for the machine rotation domain, maybe we could measure it there. But um, on the Wall Street Journal, it's... Have you looked at 
what the differences are between uh, optimizing for that objective to optimizing? Well, so part of it is just really domain more than task. Um, so there's lots of questions and imperatives in the machine translation data that the parse it as horribly on. And just having this a little bit of implicit feedback allows it to actually learn that sentences can start with a word, which they usually don't do in the Wall Street Journal. Um, and um, so it's some broad classes of kind of sentence types get fixed. Uh, I haven't looked more at like the individual arcs. And the so you have the example in your paper, <coughs> the word click, it's used once in the Wall Street Journal as a uh, yeah. noun, but then uh, the other day it's, it's always a word. It's always yeah. a word. So a so, uh, related question is, so does this, does, does the extrinsic training data result in new parameters, like new features in your model then, or is it just used to sort of reweight what's being learned along? Both. So we allow to introduce new features, um, <coughs> or, but I think we also change the weights of the data system. Um, so, I'll just give you a high level flight through um, through the multilingual part. Um, I guess hopefully you came all to Panjang and that's his talk uh, a month ago or so. Um, and that's going to be the first part. One main point that I want to kind of uh, mention is that unsupervised grammar induction, I think, is, is important if we want to say something about learnability of language. But if we want to solve the problem of building parsers and parse speech triggers for other languages, we don't really need to restrict ourselves to just working with plain text. And we should take advantage of resources that we have for other languages. So if we know what the English, in English uh, nouns and verbs are, it will help us if we have parallel data to learn what German nouns and verbs are. We don't need to just um, start from, from no information at all. And so, the approach that, that we are following is to use supervised systems um, in English and in multiple languages if possible, plus parallel text and learning uh, to build a foreign system. Um, and one kind of thing that underlies a lot of uh, the multilingual work that we've done is um, kind of unifying the part of speech tags of the different languages as a first step. So um, linguists, who uh, kind of came up with the kind of feedback annotation standards, decided that there should be four categories of nouns. And most people doing part speech induction collapsed those to one. Um, pronouns similarly can be collapsed. Um, but then when you go to German, the categories are quite different. And um, this is just some convention that people came up with. Um, and it might make sense in a particular language, but when trying to actually use part speech diagrams, this makes um, life a lot harder because you can't just ask, give me the noun. You need to know what uh, noun tags in one language are versus another. So one thing that we did was to uh, unify things and simplify the annotation standard and just have nouns, pronouns, um, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. Um, and we looked at a lot of guidelines um, for annotating part speech tags and came up with a set of 12 uh, categories, which we call some of the proverbial universal. Um, there are nuances, of course, in the languages, and there are corner cases that don't exist in another language, and um, therefore, we'll make errors um, if we collapse things just to this level, but um, they, they can be quite helpful. And so, we're going to skip the parse of each and just go to parsing. So um, in the allow us, um, to show you how useful that, um, they allow us to, to bridge um, parsing systems from one language to another. So um, I didn't talk much about the features that were used in the, in the parser that I showed at the beginning, but the parsers usually use features over the parse speech tags as well as over the lexical items. And um, we can. Um, somewhat surprisingly, um, just drop the lexical features and not lose too much in terms of accuracy. If we train, take the English tree and ignore the words and train only fe with features that look at the part speech tags, um, our, oops, our uh, unlabeled accuracy score will, for this particular model, it goes from 91 down to 82%. So it's a 
significant drop, but at the same time, um, it's not as as, as large as, as one might think. And for what, what task? For this is part of speech tagging, uh, parsing, where you only have the part of speech tag sequence. Okay. You don't know what the actual words are. And furthermore, you don't have the language specific ones, like the 45 for English. You only have these 12 categories, like noun and verb. Well, now what you can do, um, and um, let's say it goes to some work uh, that Phil Resting did, um, is you can take this model, and it doesn't really know anything explicitly about English. It knows about the English word order, but you can take a Greek sentence, and if you have a part of speech tagger, you can part of speech tag it, throw away the Greek words, and then just feed it to the parser. And even though this might sound like a crazy idea, um, it actually works much, much better than all unsupervised work uh, by a large margin. So this is kind of the starting point for the uh, parser uh, projection work that we did. And because we and I skipped it, but because we have part of speech taggers that were projected from one language to another, we do actually have um, part of speech taggers for all, all languages. So, so I would think that when you're moving from one language to another, although you might uh, <coughs> some of the information about which uh, parts of speech tend to be dependent of which other ones, uh, you might um, have higher uncertainty about those things if you're doing something basic or uh, treat that, I guess, by uh, doing re-estimation on a new language. I would also think that you might want to back off from the direction of attachment. So that might be somewhat yeah, so, common across so, languages, but it, it's surprising to me that this works without doing any of that. So, so there will be some learning on top of it, yeah. um, and it goes into that direction to kind of try to fix up uh, systematic changes. Um, and I think kind of how you do the learning then becomes an interesting problem, and I think I, I guess the question is what goes when you uh, switch to, what happens when you take your English parser and you use that on a language that has postpositions instead of prepositions and the thing has never actually seen a postposition before. So, so you can change the features to just look at distance rather than direction. Okay, that's question. Um, but even without that, like if you have an adjective and you've seen adjectives only precede nouns, if, if there's no other noun, what is the person going to do? It's going to attach it to the noun even if it's on the wrong side. Well, it depends on how you back up. Yeah. Yeah. But like, Basically, it tends to tends to work um, surprisingly well because as long as, long as things are local, things like the global word order changes, um, things go go down a little more. Um, but kind of, as a starting point, it's much better than using a DMD type model or something like that. Okay. And, so and this, we, is, this is using the uh, this is like a first order parser with with uh, the McDonald kind of. It's actually a shift reduced parser that we use just because it's faster to train. The results are go up all a little bit if you use. Uh, a graph-based parser, like a listening parser. Um, and it's really just kind of the first step of investigation. Like, uh, there's a lot of more interesting models that you can do and kind of be patient about um, maybe just treating things as a prior. But like this is sort of the, the starting point. What we then do is actually um, kind of projective transfer, um, what we call, is we use this the augmented loss perception uh, framework and for the, the <laughs> reference to Rebecca Juan here, was on the other side that I deleted. Um, so what we want, what we do is <coughs> we'll, um, take the delexicalized parser, um, and we'll take a state-of-the-art English parser and parallel data with word alignments, and then we'll parse the English side with our, the best parser that we have, and then we'll take a k-best list predicted parses for the from the delexicalized parser, and um, compute a score of how many arcs agree. So um, there are three arcs that agree with the word alignments and the arc on the other side of on the English. And there's one that violates it, and then um, one that is unaligned, so that's the case as well. And that gives us a utility, which we can then turn into a loss by just taking the negative, and then update towards it. So if the word alignments are good, we'll learn to, to flip uh, things. And, um, we can then also relexicalize the model in that step and reintroduce lexical features now of the Greek side, uh, which also helps. <coughs> so here are a um, set of results for eight uh, languages from Europe, uh, Danish, German, Greek, and so on and so forth. DMV is the Pine and Manning uh, unsupervised work. And then just a plain delexicalized transfer um, without any learning guesses uh, to the green line. Uh, doing a, the learning on top gives us a couple of percentage points, 
And this is using projected part of speech tags, the same results, basically hold uh, for global part of speech tags, but everything's a little higher. And um, this is also kind of evaluating on the standard for that particular language. So if the annotation standards differ, things will be um, quite different. Yeah. So these are all, uh, if I get the language tags right, these are all uh, Germanic yeah. elements. And one of my things that the language is a little further afield, mm -hmm. the, you know, let's say Japanese is yeah. pretty yeah. yeah. valid, valid point, valid concern. Uh, the numbers go down. Um, we have them in the paper. They're still better than the DMV numbers, usually. But uh, they are a lot lower. And we're not going to get to 100% that way. Um, one thing that helps, um, actually it's on this slide, um, so basically here, uh, this is just averaging, and this one also full sentence lengths, um, not only 10 words like Mall's cry or what gets done, but so compared to Nassim's work in averaging on the same set of European languages, um, when we do the lexicalized transfer, then learning on top, one thing that we can, a simple, Heuristic is what we call uh, multi language <laughs> learning simulation and multi language next plus projection. Is we just take all the tree bytes that we have um, for the different languages and we just concatenate them because we ignore the words anyways um, and the part of speech types are unified. We can just throw them in, in a big pool and um, it's a big hack. Um, but it actually helps because then you see more variety of how things can attach. And um, now, like 74 compared to 57, it's, it's a much, much better performance than the previous one. And this is with gold part speech tags, and with projected, everything drops by this roughly the same scale. It, it seems like there's a, another hack that's almost as easy and might work a lot better, which is uh, where you have a feature on every edge, say, what uh, language or two. Uh, um, and you can use, or a property of every edge, and you can use that property in conjunction with your existing features in a graph based parser or a transition based parser. Yeah, uh, it's a little more expensive to compute, I guess, because you need to run multiple parsers. Um, no, you're, you're running one parser, it's just that the uh, features on an English edge are different from the features on the Japanese edge. Okay, well, we double the if you. So it's like, a, times it's times like frustratingly easy domain adaptation. Yeah, you're just, yeah. You're, it's just basically shrinkage uh, yeah. back to common. Yeah. Um, I don't think we tried that. I mean, one thing we tried is, in the paper we have the numbers for trying to pick the best language to project from. And actually this averaging um, tends to work uh, as good as an oracle that tells you which one it is. Um, but yeah. Right, but you I mean, might not get as much transfer in that case. So, so the point of having um, both language specific and non-language specific portions of a feature uh, on an edge is that uh, you're going to attribute some of the strength of that edge to the non-language specific part and then it will transfer over, yeah. uh, across okay. to other languages. Yeah. I mean, this is basically the front-end version of doing hierarchical base. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. Um, so, there's, I mean, there's lots of things like this was sort of the first things that we tried and sure. um, it already, <laughs> we had way too many numbers in the paper. Uh, but yeah, so that's something that we're looking at. Um, wrapping up, um, skip the thread. Um, so yeah, um, to summarize, we talked about um, fast parsing by using uh, bind for me and course of the skates and training specific for them. <coughs> and then we talked a little bit about um, adapting, uh, where we don't care about parse accuracy per se, but we only care about downstream task application, uh, task quality. And I think, at least to my knowledge, this is the first time to sh show that improving the parser for a particular task can result in um, downstream task. Uh, quality improvements, and then we talk a little bit about projecting parsers. So um, with that, I'll just stop here and take your questions. So with this universal power speech tag set, it seems like the really the only purpose for having that is to be able to take advantage of annotated data that's been, you know, created under a variety of different annotation guidelines. I mean, like, you wouldn't, if you really only cared about parsing, then you don't, you wouldn't want to limit yourself to this course well, range, so, so. But like to picking a particular set of 12, right? Except for the fact that you want to be able to take advantage of things that people are already annotated and 
Yeah, I mean, so, so you can kind of take advantage of it for evaluation purposes. If you're building a system and projecting, you need to somehow have yeah. that. Um, and the other thing is actually, if you want to use a part of speech tagger in the real information extraction system, um, and people do that, and they do derive uh, improvements from that, they don't want to have to learn the guidelines. They want to be able to say, I mean, a simple thing, a uh, sentiment analysis. Uh, you want to be able to get the adjectives in the language, and you don't want to know what it's called, JJ or JJR, you just want to say adjective. And so, for practitioners who are actually using these systems, it makes their life a lot easier to have a unified framework, and people at Google are using it now, and before we were not using it, because it was just too complicated. <coughs> but I think, I mean, one can definitely also think about the introducing refinements using native variables. Uh, so, so, how do you view the universal tag sets fitting in with your other work on automatically refining or coarsening uh, Um It's something that uh, I've kind of mentioned to many people, but I haven't had the time to do myself and uh, nobody else. I think it would be interesting to actually try using those course categories as a starting point and then um, refine them using latent variables. And um, one can probably build better parts of speech taggers or at least like look at whether the model rediscovers the splits that the linguist came up for those languages. Um, but I haven't had the time to look into it. I think if you're aware that there was this uh, effort maybe three years ago, four years ago, with a bunch of people in India trying to develop common part of speech tags for all the Indian languages. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, they, they of course were going after much more linguistic detail. I mean, their tags would probably make Mitch very happy. But I think that as a first step, they had to do what you did. They had to first identify a core set that all languages absolutely share. Okay. And then there was some, I don't know if it was hierarchical or just two steps, but then there was another refinement which became language specific. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm not aware. You might want to look at that because I. I don't remember what the tag set was. It was a little larger than you had about 12 or so. Exactly. Uh, theirs was a little bit larger, maybe 20. Okay. Do you have uh, a reference or uh, I know the person. There is someone called Kumara. He's in Microsoft, but he's a good guy. He's not here. <laughs> so I know that there's, <laughs> yeah, some, some. He will tell you. He, was, okay. uh, he wasn't leading the effort because uh, he felt that if industry leads it, there will be political ramifications. Okay. But he was the mastermind. Okay. Uh, we'll take a turn to know him. Yeah. Other questions? It looks like there's people waiting to hear the wrong I don't know. 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 I